want to give you a brief overview of Tertullian and the reading for this week uh, on the flesh of Christ. So uh, we'll have talked a little bit about Tertullian in the background um, in class prior to this. Oh, we're a little crooked here. Uh, there we go. That's better. Uh, we'll, we'll have talked a little bit about Tertullian in class, but I uh, just want to kind of go over a few things. So he is... Um, Born uh, around 155 to 160, not exactly sure when, uh, lives until uh, the year 2020. Um, and uh, he is um, born and raised in, uh, in Carthage um, in, in North Africa. So, uh, uh, but what's significant about um, you know, that, that place of birth, uh, you know, a few things there we will have talked about in class how how Christianity really got into the culture of North Africa. So, um, you know, he he is raised in a in a context that not is certainly not entirely Christian. There were non-Christians around. They were persecuting the Christians. High persecution environment, but uh, Christianity had gotten into um, you know the, the very fabric of uh, the of life, um, and that's in contrast to everywhere else in the empire where Christianity was more of a um, urban thing amongst, um, you know, refugees, uh, you could say. Um, in, in fact, uh, the term pagan meant the countryside. Why? Because the Christians were in the city, and Christianity did not really make it into the outskirts of town, into the countryside. Um, that's because it wasn't really part of the indigenous culture. It was where, you know, re today refugees go to cities, and um, and that's what was happening uh, back in the ancient Near East. There were uh, people fleeing, um, and um, you know, they were the Christians often, and they would go to various cities. There were a number of them in the cities. Uh, it wasn't a small deal at all, but uh, it didn't really get down into the culture, except in North Africa. That's where it really did. And um, you know, so Tertullian was raised in this context. Uh, and another thing about North Africa, um, and Carthage in particular, is that it was known as a, a place of, um, a, 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 an important place for rhetoric, uh, an, imper an important place for learning how to speak and argue well. So um, you see that he imbi imbibed that, uh, that culture, that ethos, uh, as you, you read his writings. Um, and you see that there is a, a keen mind at work, a logical, rational, legal mind at work in terms of the arguments that he is presenting. So, um, you know, it was known in the ancient world, um, some argue that if you wanted someone who was a good to, to argue your case, if you wanted a good uh, 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 lawyer, you would go to North Africa because that's where they came from. Now, um, Tertullian was not only schooled in Carthage in North Africa, he went to Rome and there he learned more. Um, but then he returned to Africa uh, after his uh, stint in Rome and it is there that he actually became a Christian. So he would have been converted out of a life of paganism, polytheism, and he, he heard the gospel and you know, no reason to doubt his conversion as, as being genuine. God opened his heart. He repented and believed. And uh, that set him on a course to use his training and his knowledge and skills and gifts to uh, serve the church um, and, and not uh, the, uh, the legal state of Rome. Um, and uh, so he, he began writing um, oh, he, towards the, the Middle Ages in, in his like 50s. Um, towards the end of his life, and he wrote over a period of 16 years. During that 16 years, he wrote 31 books. So that's just about two books every year, which is quite impressive, actually, um, considering how, how detailed they are and how long they are. Uh, he, uh, you know, as you read his writings, you, you kind of see that he's not the, um, you know, kindest, gentlest uh, sort of person here. He's got an edge to him. You know, he, he can turn a phrase really well and uh, explain something well, which is why he keeps getting these requests from others to, uh, you know, to, to weigh in on various subjects. Uh, he's, a, he's a popular teacher. They want to know what he thinks. Um, but when he gives them what he thinks, um, you know, he's like one of those bloggers today that is known to uh, have, a, have a sharp tongue. Um, and, uh, uh, but 
but he's very popular and he's writing to uh, people, um, giving advice, uh, trying to uh, clarify theological matters, which uh, tells us a good deal about what the church actually was like during this time. We have more from Tertullian than uh, so many other people. Um, and we have a lot from Tertullian where he is addressing concerns throughout um, you know, the church in, in all of the areas. So through Tertullian's writings, we get a really good sense at some of the issues that were going on, some of the concerns that were going on all over um, Christendom at this time. And the assignment for this week is for you to read Tertullian's uh, On the Flesh of Christ. Uh, this was written around 203 to 206, somewhere in there. And um, this, is, uh, this is a longer uh, reading than I think the ones that we've gotten so far. It's also a good bit more difficult than the ones that you've done so far as well. Uh, so, and just to reiterate what I said before, um, I, I don't mind giving you readings that are, are probably a little bit above your you know, normal comprehension level. You know, when I read this document, it takes me a while because I have to really think about it. I can't do this while watching TV. So um, I don't mind giving you tough documents. The reason is I think you're going to get more out of reading a primary source document, even if you only understand, um, you know, 50% of it, or in the case of one coming up later by Thomas Aquinas, you'll probably only, will probably understand less. Uh, I don't mind giving you documents that you're going to have a, a low percentage of understanding because I think you gain something by actually wrestling with what the author himself or herself has to say. So, uh, yeah, re don't worry if you can't understand all of it. Um, you know, I ex expect you to devote about two to three hours trying to read it. And whatever understanding you get out of two or three hours of, of good concentrated effort, not, not half-hearted effort, good concentrated effort for two to three hours, whatever you get out of this, I am content with. So spend two to three hours on your uh, reading and then two to three hours on your writing, and that puts you right in the range of what is required for our classes um, by our accreditation agency. And uh, I think you know, th that's, that's all I'm asking you to do. Uh, as you go through here, let me just give you a couple things to, um, <clears throat> to, to think through. Um, you know, so, you know, this is about, um, as you will see, he, he's confronting Gnosticism, you know, on the flesh of Christ. He's arguing for the fact that Christ had a real flesh. Christ was in a human body, uh, both in his, um, you know, incarnation, in, in coming to earth, he assumed a true human nature. It's interesting that he says here that um, that there is no doubt concerning the spiritual substance. Uh, you know, for concerning the spiritual substance, there is no dispute. So, so no one doubts that this person of Christ was more than a mere man. Um, that's not in question here. What's in question is whether or not he is also a real uh, human being. Um, whether he truly took on flesh, and whether he will be he is raised in his flesh, and also whether we will be raised in our flesh into to real human um, bodily existence uh, in the resurrection. You see, the the author here, Tertullian, is seeing that all all those three things are connected: Christ's coming in the flesh, Christ being raised in the flesh, and our being raised in the flesh. Uh, Tertullian sees, I think rightly, that these will rise and fall together. So he's addressing the, the whole gamut of them. Uh, so as you read this, uh, consider, um, you know, what's at stake in this debate? You know, why is it so important that he weigh in on this topic? Why is it important that the church agree with him? Why is it important that he refute Marcion uh, and the others that he is uh, attacking because he considers them having attacked the true church? Um, also, notice here, um, what is the ground of his argument? Uh, Tertullian is known for a lot of memorable phrases from the early church, one of them uh, being, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? by which he meant, what does the Greek philosophy have to do with the Christian faith? And what he's arguing there is that we should not elevate reason to the same level that the Greek philosophy does. We should not try to make Christianity 
uh, compatible with Greek philosophy and the, the um, idolatry of reason that Greek philosophy had. Instead, we should, uh, Augustine, I mean, um, Tertullian would have said, we believe because it is absurd. And he has a great phrase, uh, you know, shortly, not, not too far into this document here, where he talks about how um, he says it is immediately credible because it is silly. So, you know, think about the ground of his argument. And I, I think what, what Tertullian is doing, you know, he had a number of theological errors that we can talk about in class if we'll get, get a chance. But there were really good things going on in his theology as well. Because what I think he tries to do is he tries to uh, center this argument that he's making. He tries to ground this argument that he's making in the flow of biblical theology, in the flow of the biblical narrative. He tries to locate it there, not in Greek philosophy, as he sees other people like Justin Martyr and Origen and all those who are coming out of the Alexandrian school doing. And that is why, um, you know, he, he speaks of, uh, he, he, he brings in the idea that, that we believe the gospel because it's foolishness, um, in the sense that the gospel is the foolishness of God um, bringing the wise to shame. So, you know, if we attach the gospel to the wisdom of the world, we will, we will actually end up with no gospel at all, because um, in the end of the day, uh, God's, God's quote, foolishness. The, the, the world considers the gospel foolishness. The world considers God foolish for sending his son to die on the cross. That foolishness will trump the wisdom of the wise. Um, and, uh, and so he's very concerned that we don't attach the credibility of the gospel to Greek philosophy because he sees that as a no-win game. Uh, so, you know, pay attention to the ground of his argument and see if you agree with that assertion that I made that uh, Tertullian is trying, at least, to locate his argument in the context of the storyline of the Bible, particularly as he is uh, sensitive to what God is doing in Christ to show, um, to, to engender faith in true believers and show the, uh, the world as being wrong. And then also consider uh, the kind of argument that he's actually making. How does he argue? What arguments does he use to make this point? Uh, and if you do that, I think you will, um, you know, get kind of, you might not understand everything that he's making, argument that he's making, but you'll see a lot of what he's trying to say. Uh, well, uh, you know, have fun with this reading. Um, it is... Uh, it is not easy, but uh, I think you will learn something from the, the struggle through.